You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. This podcast is presented by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, who have been telling Oklahoma's story through its people since 1927. Follow them online at oklahomahof.com, and then definitely follow them on Instagram for all the information that you need, because I'm sure that's where you follow us as well, at oklahomahof. Let's get into today's episode. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma. Mike Hoon here, your host, back with another episode up in Edmond today with Rashawn uh, Copeland. Man, I'm so excited for this episode. Like, you know, I told you earlier, when people reach out to me, I always say, like, look, if I don't get back to you in a week, please message me back because, you know, you get so many notifications or whatever and you just get busy and you always, you know, I, I'm terrible. At forget, I always forget things. But you did reach back out and it was Friday, I think, <laughs> and we were like, this is Monday, we're recording now, let's do it. Yeah. Uh, so, man, I really appreciate you doing that and then doing a lot of research and looking into you and, and all the cool things that you do and, you know, you have a huge following on, on social media and you have a great tag wow. on social media, don't you? Yeah, Which yeah, is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> uh, You know, we were just talking about getting good, good like, Instagram names or Instagram t- ads or whatever and you have a Definitely. fantastic one. Um, but yeah, really excited. Thanks for welcoming me into the house and, and excited to hear, you know, much about the story and the new book and everything yeah, else. Right. But for everyone listening that doesn't know who you are and who are you and what do you do? Well, Mike, thank you so much again for having me. I'm humbled to be on the show with you, man. And yeah, my name is Rashawn Copeland. Uh, I would like to say I'm a minister who writes and a writer who preaches. But before any of that, uh, I'm a father and a husband and a son, uh, most importantly. But it's really fun. I'm on a journey, man. I think it's one of the greatest delights to be able to just love people and reach them where they are, just like I was met where I was when I was far off and broken like and I'm still broken to this day but there were days where I was in a in a big rut yeah you know have yeah. To, so, so you're in ministry. Yeah. Uh, what church do you, do you work at for a church or at a church? Well, currently I'm planted at a church in Moore, Oklahoma called Elevate Church. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I love uh, to go and serve anywhere and everywhere the Lord is leading. So like I'll be at Our Lord's on a weekend, maybe mm-hmm. Frontline Church all across the board, you know, even Life Church at times, uh, you know, but really just serving and being the church is what I love to do rather Rather than put emphasis sure. on the building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so this whole journey that that you're on, and and um, you know, this is this is not the first book, right? You've written more. Yeah, I've written more, right. but I probably wouldn't claim the other okay. ones as much as this okay. one. Like, yeah. this is the one I like literally poured my heart, mind, and soul into. I cried over the keyboard. Like everything went yeah. into this one, uh, and also I had a lot of editorial help on this one. The okay. other ones were just whoo, just something that was a heart cry yeah, that I yeah, wanted yeah. to get out for more personal reasons. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so grew up, born and raised in Oklahoma. Yeah. Born and raised right here. Uh, well actually the raised part, it was kind of tricky cause my dad was in the military. Okay. We were in and out, like in and out burger. Uh, like we lived in Miami. We lived in San Antonio, uh, Baltimore, all across the United States at times. Yeah. But I would say the buckle of the Bible Belt is my home, Oklahoma. So. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, so, but Dad's in military, so I assume somewhere in Lawton, maybe. Yeah, Lawton. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, they, yeah. they live there now, actually, okay. too. So yeah. he's retired and living, living life, I guess. Yeah. So, so you, I guess, born here, and then when did you move away, and when did you come back? Well, um, I, we had many times like uh, different seasons and stages where I would like leave for a couple years, and we would come back, and I would leave for another couple years and come Mm -hmm. back but I would say we really started moving uh yeah it was all throughout my life man yeah yeah but uh, I did spend a lot of time you know at Lawton MacArthur that's where I went to high school uh several years and um then I came back here when I came to college after junior college and when I was at University of Kansas I came to UCL to play football okay so football brought me back in a way yeah so yeah. grew up uh, brothers and sisters yeah brothers and sisters I got uh, three brothers and I do have a, I would call a god sister where uh-huh. my mom and dad sort of 
took a daughter underneath their wings and started caring for yeah. her because yeah. their mom was out for a while. Yeah. So, so, I mean, what what is it like kind of growing up, moving all the time and learning all different things, seeing different cultures mm. and, and kind of not really having... Not, I guess you weren't really setting your roots somewhere in a, yeah. in a place for so long, right? Because you knew you might have been moving again. What was that like? So true. It was really insightful, but it was also really inspiring. Mm. I would say it was insightful because I was able to get into places that I never could, would have been able to get into had it not been for the military. For instance, yeah. I would spend time in little old Topeka, Kansas. Now, it's kind of, it's the capital, so it's a pretty bigger <laughs> yeah. city. But I went to a predominantly white school. I was like one of the only black guys in the school. We had several others, but I was like that athlete. Sure. So I got to spend time with you know just that amazing you know culture of people that I never was used to right mm -hmm. and then I had an X amount of time where I was at a school in Miami Southridge was primarily black you know all black and Hispanic yeah so I got to see both sides you know but what was funny was when I moved from Kansas to Miami Florida they would call me Toto because they knew I came from Kansas the dog from Wizard of Oz <laughs> and I was like what hey leave me alone dude Y'all, <laughs> these guys think they funny yeah and then you know sort of when I went back to because I went I waffled back and forth several times because my dad kept me a station back and forth from Kansas to Miami okay. and it's totally culture shock on oh, both yeah. ends but what was amazing about it is um, I always brought this sort of I was the black guy that talked like almost a white boy at times when I would go sure. out there but then again I had this side of me whenever I would go back to Kansas, it was beneficial because I was around so many well-seasoned athletes. So I brought like a little bit of pride and gotcha. stardom to, yeah, and very yeah. well athleticism back there, yeah. and which helped me shine and get a lot of scholarships and things like that. Because the competition level is a lot different between the two oh, states. I'm sure it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like it's... That's such a like I think I know me and being for the UK and coming here is a different culture shock but also like I've been to Miami I haven't been to Kansas but gotcha. I, know, I know a lot of people who have been to Kansas and they say it's a lot kind of similar to some of the places we have yeah. here and mine that that's a huge difference isn't totally it? going to Miami and seeing everything because Miami's like you either got like the super rich or, or like the, the it's such mm. a difference it's not oh, like there's man. not like a gradual mix of classes is it? it's like you've got people who work for, for all the super rich and then you yeah. have the super rich there's no middle class in Miami is there wow no right? no no which is really like when which I was, is wow yeah it is and it's yeah. it can be a scary place yeah yeah it, oh intimidating and you know I would say only one other place is more intimidating to me is uh, the concrete jungle in New York City man yeah. I got intimidated when I went there for a little <laughs> bit but you know everywhere yeah. else seemed fine yeah so you were pretty good at sports growing up then yeah decently yeah I was pretty good. Uh, my humble side would say, you weren't that <laughs> good, humble. but yeah. I was pretty Tell good. Yeah. <laughs> you played football? Yeah, I played football. I uh, spent like, my childhood all the way you know, through um, college mm -hmm. playing. And you know, during those years, it was really a season and a time where I was just trying to figure out who I was, and I would attach my identity to that sport yeah. in a huge way. And you know, everything would fall and rise on whether how good I was doing in that sport you know and my affirmation was coming from my coaches and my dad if they weren't giving it to me I would try to go find it somewhere else such yeah. as women and maybe even marijuana drugs when I was you know a little bit in high school mm -hmm. trying to figure the way because I had all, all these other people pointing the way for me sure. and it just got really tough during yeah. some times but I was still doing really well performance wise mm -hmm. Uh, and I finally got to uh, almost to the college before, you know, I got shot down, gunned down, left for dead whenever I was a senior in high school wow. uh, after a little bit after a football game. Yeah. You know, trying to defend the honor of a girl. So that was like a big, big transitional period yeah. for me. Yeah. We'll, we'll touch on that in a little bit. But okay. so tell me about like, so w in your high school years, are you in Oklahoma or are you in Miami or are you in Kansas? All three. Well, because all three. Ninth okay. grade, I was in Miami. Yeah. Tenth grade, I was in law in Oklahoma at MacArthur. Uh, eleventh, a little bit of eleventh grade, I was still at MacArthur. 
the second half of 11th grade, I went to Washboro High School in Topeka, Kansas, mm -hmm. and concluded there. You okay. Finished there. Yeah. So, so you were like, I guess coming into some of these schools, you're like pretty good at football. You made the team kind of straight away. Yeah. Yeah. Like some of the coaches were like, oh, great. We've got this star guy coming in from out of town. I'm True. sure that. So, you know what? Ninth grade was really the big stepping stone for mm -hmm. me. I was an underdog on that team. Wasn't really performing up to par yeah. when it comes to the Miami boys. However, whenever I got there and started getting beat up, beat down, yeah. learned a little bit of uh, you know skills that I did not have when I went there, mm -hmm. and then I brought it back to Kansas, and I mean Oklahoma, then Kansas, yeah. that's whenever, like that really sort of paved the way for me and set that firm foundation on like, sure. you know, what it takes to really succeed mentally, physically, emotionally, from a standpoint of sports. Yeah. And that really helped me in my trajectory as far as from a mentality standpoint. Yeah. With football. So you, you get to Kansas, you finish out kind of high school in Kansas or so like yeah. if you're like the time where colleges are looking at you is probably while you're at Kansas then. Yeah, right? while like I was you're in like Kansas. kind of 16 to 18 years old, you're like yeah. really kind of developing and then college is in the mindset. Yeah. Are you thinking time to go play football in college when you're that age? Oh yeah. yeah. Like at that point, I was uh I would say the prideful egotistical high school football player. <laughs> in my mind I was yeah. this fully future college sure. football star. Yeah. So I was like, okay, Whatever scholarships land on the table, I'm going to have an open mind towards them all. And then one of my big, big dream schools came on, University of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And I was like, OK, I'm going here, period. Yeah. And then yeah. tragedy struck a little bit, you know, after that. But I did have the schools I was looking for. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So tell, tell me about like what, what that tragedy was, how it all happened. Like, how, I mean, how does that yeah, it sort of came out of nowhere, man. Like, you know, because I'm riding this, you know, my mind is like in the clouds, feet uh -huh. on the ground, and I'm running after my dreams. And as I'm at this uh, point, you know, where I'm deciding, hey, OK, I'm getting close to this scholarship and having this thing go the way mm -hmm. I want it to go. Um, I was like, there's still this void, this emptiness in me where I'm trying to figure things out because football ain't necessarily filling that little void. So sure. I went off and looked into you know having my dream girl like maybe I can find a chick right here in my school that I'm in love with or in the city that I'm in love with so I finally met this young girl uh, that I was started dating and uh, I end up uh, you know being a weekend or so on day in Daner we're hanging out at this park and as we're sitting at this park getting ready to go to a movie um all of a sudden she gets a phone call brrr, yeah brrr, you know me being prideful and egotistical uh college football future star I take her phone and I'm like I got you like I know this is that guy calling which yeah. was her ex and I pick it up I'm like hello and the ex says yo who is this who is this why are you with my girl and i'm like hold on man this is my girl you yeah. gotta chill out my girl yeah my girl. <laughs> i'm talking about yeah her. yeah but i end up uh, uh telling them no dude this is my girl and in so sort of really unwise thing to do i say come come where i am uh, and i gave my address that was uh, totally yeah. unwise that was foolish but needless to say I, I hung up not thinking much of it like this guy anyway if he yeah. come he's like five nine i'm this you know almost football, 16 yeah, football yeah. you know <laughs> so we're sitting and all of a sudden 10 minutes later after listening to this rap song album called get rich or die trying yeah by 50 cent all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this van peels into the parking lot and immediately catches our attention. Yeah. And uh, they park about 20 feet away. Five guys jump out of the car. I'm not talking about burgers. And they're walking tar towards us. And we get out and we start... Well, no, actually, it was just me. I got yeah. out. I got out the car at that point. I said, you stay here. Right. She was getting ready to get out to try to stop. I was like, no, you stay here. And fearfully, yet yeah, pridefully, yeah, like I'll passionately, say, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I get out. And yeah. I'm walking towards them. They're walking towards me. I'm nervous out of my mind. It's racing, heart's yeah. beating. And as I get about five feet away from them, one of the guys pull out. A pistol. He reaches for his waistband. Yeah. He raves it in the air. 
I'm like, oh, he got a gun. Like I would see things like yeah. this in movies, but to think like I'm literally, you know, happening yeah, in Topeka, it's happening. Kansas. Yeah. yeah, like where you're at. Exactly. Yeah. And I turn, I run, I try to run, I slip and I fall, and he stands over me. Boom. Boom. Two gunshots ring out. And then I am just in awe. I'm scared. I'm yeah. nervous. Because at this point, I didn't know if my life was about to end right there in that moment. Those guys run off. And I realized I didn't know like fully if I had been shot yet. Because yeah. the adrenaline, I got up and I ran. But as I ran back towards the car and I dive at the left side of the car, I look up into the driver's seat or the passenger seat yeah. and the girl's gone. And it's pitch black, and I see these headlights pulling up behind me. I'm thinking they're going to jump out the car yeah, and finish yeah. me. And I'm laying on this cold cement, and by the grace of God, they peel out and they leave. But um, in this pitch black, yeah. on this cold cement, and all of a sudden, I feel this warm blood trickling up my back. And at that point, I knew I was shot, and I went into a panic attack. Yeah. And for the first time ever, I cried out to the God of the universe, the person I would hear about. But needless to say, I needed him yeah. more than ever in that moment. And I would say, essentially, he met me there in that dark moment. Yeah. So yeah. Who, like, who came for you? What happened? So who came for me, which is a great question. You know, in that moment, again, being all alone, I came to this realization as, again, I was anxious and scared. I came to this realization that my coaches aren't there. My parents aren't there. My friends aren't there. Yeah. The girl isn't there. Did I ever live? You know, the reality, what was there was the fear of death that mm -hmm. I was going to die. But by the grace of God, he sent a man that I could never even recall where he is now today. But he picked me up, threw me in his pickup truck, which was like 20 minutes later, yeah. which felt like an eternity later. Sure. And he throws me in his, his truck and he gets me to the hospital and yeah, I finally get in the hospital and this dude's shirt is straight red. It yeah. was white, but it was straight red. And I just was like, wow, like because of my blood. And yeah, it was yeah. just crazy, bro. Yeah. And then I finally, yeah, got to this place where my life was essentially saved, you know? That's oh, Yeah. So where where did they with that did you know do you know who it was that shot you? Like what happened? Yeah. So we later had found out it was her ex boyfriend mm -hmm. and he basically was found maybe a week or two late. No, it may have been right around seven six mm -hmm. days, six days or so. And he ended up getting arrested the guys that were with him got arrested, but they got off right. because they were willing to go against him in the courtroom saying right. he did it, uh, which I, you know, either way, I wanted justice to be done, of course. Of course. Right? Yeah, yeah. But um, I think one of the big things I was able to take from that is, wow, the brevity of life, how short life is. And I, I didn't deserve to be alive at that point. But, yeah. you know the grace of God and I'll just pray for the, the man that shot me every day which yeah. I end up can tell you more about his story but he ends up doing about uh, three years but he kept getting in trouble in jail uh -huh. it went to about six years because of the extended time but when he got out uh, sadly uh, he was at this place a party and he continued in that life he was living mm -hmm. and he was shot down gun down and he now he's paralyzed today from the last thing I've heard and I keep the yeah. guy in my prayers and I tried to write him letters but I've never got a return but yeah yeah it's uh, tough it's, yeah it is like yeah. it's you know it's you world. you go from like you know like I am on top of the world I'm a super star football player I'm yeah. going to go to college somewhere to like laying in a parking lot in the dark with no mm. one around Man. with just your thoughts wow which is a scary place. Yeah. And then you feel like that warm, you like, you, you feel that warm sensation of the blood. Yeah. And you know that you've definitely been shot because so your adrenaline true. started running off. I can't imagine the thoughts you kept having, like yeah. places you go to. Like right. literally the girl I was chasing and that I was in love with, I felt forsaken because she wasn't there. Yeah. Like the people who I always depended on and loved 
weren't there. It wasn't that they didn't care, but they mm-hmm. didn't know. Nor did they have the power to be omnip- omniscient yeah. and be everywhere at all times to all people. Like, but I knew that I had. This why my faith is so strong. I had to call out to yeah. the God who knew me, man. And yeah, I'm so thankful he he saved me. Do yeah. you have before that kind of time? Were you did you go to church? Were you you know like, did you kind of have the same connection or rebel. just yeah? <laughs> yeah yeah? I was a rebel. Uh, I would say a hedonist. Like um, yeah, I was all about selfish desire, mm-hmm. pursuit, my way, my will all the time, and very selfish. And but I think one of the big things was my grandparents, <laughs> my mom's faith people who would come into the FCA programs Mm -hmm. and speak to us, those people were the ones who really marked my faith and sort of plant the seed so it can flourish in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you go from that moment you're in, you know, you're like laying in hospital. Like, yeah. I mean, so thank and literally a new lease on life. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, one of the humbling things about being in that hospital it wasn't when the doctor had to come in and do his thing or, you know, the nurses telling me like, you know, the nurses asking questions back and forth to one another, whether or not this guy's going to survive and this and that. Yeah. But the most humbling thing that happened while I was in that hospital, which felt like, you know, on the verge of death um, was when my dad had walked in this bravado, you know, military man yeah. had walked in and his face was flooded with tears. Like that was the first time I had ever seen my dad cry in my life. And it did something to me far more than that bullet wound could ever did. Yeah. Uh, to see just his heart and his humility f- and his care for me as his son. Uh-huh. Uh, it gave me a new perspective on, yeah, it's hard for even me. And that can do a lot for a kid. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because if you've grown up, like, I mean, I, I, my dad's not in the military, but I know enough people who have military parents. And yeah. they're regimented. They're grown up. They're like that. They're yeah. like that to everyone. But you, when you see that side of your dad that you've never, ever seen before. True. Right? Yeah. Because he's been working, you know, 10, 12 hours a day, being in the military. Boom. You know, with all his everything that you've got to do and the way that way of life yeah you, you can't just flick that off and come home and be dad exactly right? so you grew up and your brothers and sisters grew up you know with that Man. and then and he still has the mentality when he gets yeah. home he, sometimes he didn't know how to turn it off right. and all he knew how to be is a th- I mean I mean he was a father who cared but he was more yeah. of an authoritative style leader yeah that uh, wanted to point us to do all he could to point us in the right direction, to be men of integrity, men sure. of honor, uh, men of great, you know, performance that do things that yeah. are great. But to really like take a moment and yeah. really zoom into our hearts, he didn't do that a lot. Yeah. You know, I guess during that time in the hospital, you just do a lot of thinking. Oh, yeah. Tons of thinking. Right? Like, yeah. Contemplating, questioning. Yeah. You know, all that. Are you kind of after that, when that happens and you're in the house, are you thinking you like planning the total different future that you're going to have now? Are you like, okay, football might be done now. So what, you know, what else am I going to do? How am I going to give this? How am I going to repay this gift that I've been given with with life? You know, like what is, what are you, are you thinking those things or you, because now you have like this huge connection with faith and and religion and and high power that you never did before as well. Yeah. So what, what's going through your mind that time? It's a great question, man. Great question, bro. So I would say specifically the big thing uh, that was going through my mind were the people where there was a sudden, sudden shut off uh, that I felt from the people who I thought cared most. Like, mm-hmm. number one, I thought the coaches that were calling me every single week cared so much about me yeah. to the point where even through this, they would stick with me. But come to find out that call that I got after the gunshot were coaches saying, hey, we're, we're done. We can't take you in. Yeah. We can't take in a potential gang member. We can't take in this guy. We can't wow. take in that. So yeah. I began to have scholarships stripped from me. Nebraska, it was gone. Mm-hmm. Memphis, it was gone. All these other schools that would be like poster child dream schools for me in yeah. a way were began to vanish before my eyes. And not only that, you know, the people who were in my circle, mm-hmm. teammates, friends, 
at this point, they're hearing rumors through the grapevine that Rashawn is just a negative influence. He and then all my friends began to to go. He, what good is he going to be on the field now? Right. Yeah. Like, and and a lot of times, even for me personally, when I have friends going through great trials or tragedy, suffering, mm-hmm. I tend to want to. You know, do my quick little thing and help, and then yeah. move away because I feel as though because they're going through that hurt, they don't want to, they don't want me. There's a hundred other people right. that can be with them right now, so they, I started to see a lot of friends I thought would be close move away from me instead mm-hmm. of close to me during that time, and that was just tough in and of itself. So I was wrestling more with like uh, relational issues and sure. tensions uh, that I felt should have been far greater. You know, as far as yeah support wise but uh yeah it was less about the pain and agony i was going through but more about um the pain that you know having to be separated from the what you love most and who you love most Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i guess you realize what i guess your life is really about who it's Mm -hmm. about and the time and that everything's happening yeah right and then so this all happens uh you're still in school, obviously, right? Yeah, so you yeah, finish up school, school, finish up high school, and then, I mean, what are you thinking from there? What, where do you go from there? So while I'm in school, I'm still in this place where, you know, I took a lot of days off and I had to catch play catch up after mm-hmm. I started to heal because I was far away from doing school sure. work. But what was cool about that is uh, I had so much support, like different teachers and, you know, support come alongside me to get me caught up. But what was awesome, you know, God began to restore me. He began to heal me, man. And I got better months later. So it took about three months for my leg to get a bit about better where I can start walking with a limp. Did a lot of rehab. But before yeah. the school year was over, I would say miraculously, you know, I was back on a track track uh, running. Okay. And I actually made it to state that year, my four by four team. Yeah. And we uh, almost won state. We came third, I believe. But football was still in the air because I didn't get a lot of scholarships. But there were several schools wanting to take a risk on me. Sure. And that was junior colleges. And at that point, you know, I was like, I had to make a decision. But for a guy who likes to be liked and do what he likes, I wanted to go D1 straight out of Close. high school. That yeah. was my plan, my goal, my glory. But I ended up saying, hey, I got to settle with what I can get. So I went to a Divi- or, uh, Juco yeah. and uh, went and played there. And that's what happened next, you know? Yeah. So, so you go to the Juco and you're still like you're training, you're better getting fitter. And the goal is to after two years, you're going to transfer somewhere yeah. if you want, right? That's, that's still a dream. That's the goal. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So my grades that? tanked when I got there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Why was man. that? Well, I just had a lot of, you know, typically junior in college gets a lot of the guys who were felon in high school. Yeah, and typically they get a lot of the guys who were had behavioral issues, maybe even you know was you know. So we had a lot of guys that were selling drugs in the dorms. We had yeah. a lot of just guys from the hood, all kind of things yeah. going on, um, and. I really sort of came accustomed to their ways, you know, bad company corrupts good character. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, who we hang around with is essentially who we'll become. Like those different things. So I end up, yeah, getting in the wrong pack and ran with the wolves. And needless to say, I fell at the hands of that. And it extended my JUCO time to almost three years or three and a half. Yeah. And which really killed some of my division one stuff as well. But by the grace of God, I was able to go to university of Kansas, play under Mangino yeah. for a second. But yeah, that was short lived so as well. So my wife's family, my, my father-in-law and my wife's family on her dad's side, a huge KU fan. Nice. Oh, like rock chalk. Massive, what? Like hate football season, obviously, <laughs> but like basketball, yeah. you know, they love, they're yes. huge KU fans. Whew. Um, I think, is it Learned Hall, something like that? Oh. The engineering building, someone? Oh, yeah, so yeah. My, my wife's last name's Learned. So, like, one of her great, someone that she doesn't know anymore was like donated Whoa. money. But didn't donate any money to her, but. You know, That's but, crazy. Anyway, she, yeah, she was kind of mad. She was, she wanted to go to KU, but they wouldn't give her 
I don't think they give her like some some scholarship. I don't know. Oh, okay, anyway, specific. She didn't go to KU. Wow. Uh, but yeah, Leonard Hall, I think, is what it's Where's called. she end up going? She went to OU. Oh, but, okay. Yeah. Boomer. Yeah, okay. So. Boomer, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, small world. So she, uh, that has a little tie to my wife's side of the family. Um, anyway, so so you go to KU. Yeah. You're like, okay, I'm, st- I'm still going somewhere. Oh, right? I felt good. You know? That was right around the time the Orange Bowl, the big team, you know, they were doing amazing things. Probably one of the best teams in hit yeah. KU history during that time, I and know. I was on the part a part of that team coming in on the back end of that. Yeah, so I, I was feeling good about myself. Again. Yeah, and back to you know, but I guess was yeah. the JUCO in Kansas or not? Uh, JUCO was in Kansas. Okay, so you're in community Can- okay. college. You're in Can- Kansas this whole Scott. time, so yeah. you are like going to one of the best schools in Kansas now. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Take me there. How was that whole experience? Um, so whenever I got, you know, back in the D1 mode, college mode, mm-hmm. um, I come to find out, you know, after amazing workouts and doing some great things, I, I come to find out that according to NCAA Clearinghouse, I only had one year left of eligibility with Division One play. So. so with that being said, the defensive coordinator brought me in one day and he was like, Rashawn. I'm going to leave this completely up to you. It's your choice. But I would suggest that you would go to Division Two and play two more years, mm-hmm. two full years, rather than, say, Division One and get to play only one year. Yeah. Uh, I just think it's more beneficial for you as the athlete, student athlete. And I was like questioning, but I was wrestling and I was thinking like, man, I'm finally here. My name is in the locker. I got my number. Like I'm in big D one, you know, big yeah. 12 school. No, I, but then the other side of me was like, the reality is, you know, there's tons, any, almost any of these D twos in the country would take you. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, what if I go there and I start strong two years and yeah. maybe I can have that hope to get in the NFL. You never know. But I began to wrestle between those ideas and eventually I decided I would become a UCO Bronco. OK. Yeah. Yeah. And because I was it was right down the road, close to home. Yeah. I mean, I had other schools like, you know, Delta in Mississippi. That was one of the it was the number one team at that time in the mm-hmm. country, D2. And I was thinking, hey, I could go there or just be close to home. And I decided because I had a kid out of marriage early mm-hmm. Acting a fool with one of my f- friends in a way, yeah. a girl that I was a friend with, I might as well stay close to home where grandma is. Yeah, and, you know, I can get you know some help. Yeah. So then you like I'm you know go to UCO and you come to Edmond. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's what happened, Edmond. And then Broncos playing. Do you play? Do you play for two years? Yeah. So I ended up playing. Yeah, for the last two years. And I stayed an extra year so I can commission into the Army as a medical service officer. So I joined the ROTC program okay, yeah. after those two years as well. Uh, but I ended up staying three more years in college to finish that thing. Yeah. Out. So, so after that, did you go into the military or did you just do the ROTC stuff? So? Uh, I did. actually did uh, ROTC but I did a program, so I was already okay. in the military, but yeah. I did a simultaneous program yeah. that they have, uh, which was really fun, too. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. My time. Dad, Hoo-ha. Dad Hoo-ha. was really proud of that. Yeah, Dad was pumped of that. And matter of fact, one of the big reasons that provoked me outside of the selfish reasons of having a strong, stable financial flow was I wanted to prove to my dad mm-hmm. that I could, one, outrank him when I get into the military to make him <laughs> proud, you know, yeah. you know, make him a little envious. And I'm yeah. just like, I'm just like, he, yeah. he, he loved the fact that I was commissioned in the army, but I really, a lot of it was to get his affirmation and his, yeah. his thumbs up in a way. Yeah. Yeah. So. So you, I guess, play at UCO, graduate from UCO, yeah. and then you're like, now, I mean, what happened? Now what? Are you thinking? Because yeah. I assume at this time you're still like, you're still learning, you're still growing, you still have, you know, this this faith, right? And this new kind of like, you're grateful every yeah. day, you know, because you're always like, hey, I know it's bad, but it, I could not be here. Totally. Right now. So totally. You, so you're living with all that, mm-hmm. and then you graduate, and you're like, now what? Like, yeah. Like, do, we, do you know that? Because I guess NFL is not going to happen. What are you thinking? 
career wise do you go further into the military or you wow. like, where did you go from there that's really good so career wise i began to get some letters some calls to the cfl canadian football league okay so that was a question in there but i was like realistically uh, I, I just feel like being done with football. Now that I have my son in mm-hmm. the world, I, there was a side of me wanted to play, but I wanted to really, I wanted security in knowing that I'll have him taken care of. Yeah. Even if the girl walks out or whatever happens. So military was the only thing I knew. I grew up in military homes on military yeah. bases my whole life, and they knew how to take care of their people. Yeah. And I was like, okay, let me do it. And I end up, you know, essentially, you know, joining ROTC, uh, went to Army Medical School mm-hmm. right after college, after I commissioned in San Antonio. When I commissioned into the Army, I began to question, like, should I stay here yeah. in the military? I mean, I'm enjoying it. I'm partying it up. You know, everything from, you know, going, you know, doing my deal in there. But also I'm living it up with the guys. I mean, we're going to strip clubs. We're, we're living that type of life. Yeah. It was just crazy, man. Uh, we were actually in Texas okay. at this time. Yeah. However, this is what sort of spurred that on. Like, we we're all there's so much many conversations going on like hey bro what are you gonna do after your stint your sure. contract is up yeah. and we will all talk about this like I'm gonna go get in business man I'm gonna go start me a business mm-hmm. with the money that I get from military and then I would hear other guys say other things like I'm gonna go back and run my dad's farm or whatever sure. like whatever it looks like but for me personally I was trying to really shape in um just move in a direction I thought was best and I would see my cousin out in Los Angeles in movies like American Pie. Yeah. He was in American Reunion, one of the only black guys in that movie. So, <laughs> and then uh, also the lucky one was Zac Efron. He was Zac Efron's best friend okay. in that movie. And I was like, okay, my cousin's out there doing it big. Here goes my discontentment sort of driving me out sure. to L.A. now. So I'm going to go out there. I may even go AWOL and leave this military <laughs> stuff yeah. with the way he's living. And I decided I'm going to go out there. And I did, man. And um, I was still in the military, but I was basically in the reserves going mm-hmm. almost AWOL in a way. Yeah. Just to fulfill these desires of my own heart, man. And yeah crazy world. it got more crazy after that so yeah yeah so you go to hollywood like hollywood, in hollywood west hollywood yeah. to be exact yeah and i began to be a viner i don't remember okay. i don't know if you remember yeah, vine yeah, yeah. but i began to explode on that platform along with some of the guys i was with i would yeah uh, be with a lot of youtubers and write the i was riding the rocket ship of social media fame and sure out of nowhere bro like after all this stuff begins to happen you know my platforms are exploding i'm getting contracts opportunities yeah coming from all over the place you know um i remember like brand deals and stuff yeah like that. brand deals all over the place and one uh thing that really stuck out to me is that um i began to get with an artist who was a really well-known artist uh it was a hype man for this guy who was from kansas city tech nine strange mm-hmm. music worked with some of them but needless to say i'm connected with a with an agent out in la at a club one night and he ends up connecting me with Soldier Boy, and I became a hype man for Soldier Boy for a minute. So yeah. I'm, I'm I'm way ahead of myself at this point, and I'm sleeping around, I'm indulging myself, I'm whatever it looks like yeah. to YOLO, live now, live once, whatever. Sure. And I even got to a point where I began dating this girl that I thought was my dream girl. I thought she was everything I wanted. She was in law school at USC. Uh, On the other end, because she wasn't satisfying me fully all the time, Mm -hmm. I had these other desires. I end up looking over to the porn industry to see if that had what I needed. Yeah. And there was a young uh, lady in the porn industry I was in an emotional affair with. Like, I was everywhere, bro. Yeah. That's what I'm just trying to get to. Like, how, I was in a how broken old are you at this point? place. Um, I was at that point in between 24 and 26, yeah. like somewhere in there, that bubble uh, at that point. And yeah. it was just, yeah, my time but to live in like, like the social media, I guess, like, lifestyle with yeah. people coming like social media influencer lifestyle like oh being yeah kind of social media famous and brand deals coming at you and stuff like that yeah 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 and 
it was it felt like it was right where I wanted to be. But despite the outward quote unquote success, yeah, I was inwardly miserable. Mm-hmm. You know, and the wealth and you know, whatever it looked like, it wasn't profiting anything for sure. me. Um, except for insanity, bro, you know, just straight depression, oppression, stress, whatever you name it. And I remember one night, you know, I was sitting in my house yeah. and I was like, this can't be life. There has to be more. Like, why am I here? Why am I not satisfied? I'm doing everything I ever wanted to do. And then it hit me. It was like. One, there's a side of me saying, take your own life. Mm-hmm. Like there's, it's worthless. There's nothing beyond this. And that's what depression does. It puts us in a box sure. and it tells us there's nothing beyond this. Yeah. And I remember, you know, going to the other room go to go grab a pistol. I was going to, you know, it felt like an eternity going down that hall to get it too. But as I turn back around and I go back down to the room, I get on my knees and I'm about to take my life. I'm shaking, I'm sweating, and I set the gun down, I pick it back up, I put it in my mouth, I'm shaking, I'm sweating, I shake, you know, I put the gun back down, pick it back up, shaking, sweating, but there were two things that flashed before, you know, my mind at this point, I was thinking through, number one, if I were to shoot myself right now, and I were to live, Mm. I would have to go through that same pain I went through as a 17 year old boy when that bullet, you know, wreck havoc on my body yeah. at that time. And I know how excruciating that is. So I don't want to live through this. Number yeah. one, if it were to go down, if I were to shoot myself. But number two, the second thought that I had was that if I were to shoot myself and I were to die. And I've heard all the tales of when you die, but I would have to one face this omnipotent omniscient, all-knowing, all-seeing God who's infinite in wisdom and knowledge and understanding, who's loving. But on the other end of that, he's holy and he's just and he's different. And I've offended him in so many ways in my life. Am I ready to face him? And I just had that at the ask, introspectively ask that critical question. Am I ready to meet my maker? And as I began to count the costs and look at both of them, I was like, there's only one way, one thing I need to do. Damn. I need to humble myself. I need to cry out to the God of the universe, the one who made me and figure out why I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that was so a piece of it. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's not when, I mean, there's a piece of it, but that's like, it's kind of like when it happens at 17 and you're like, oh, like I, I'm, I'm alive. Like I'm thankful. Yeah. I'm grateful. I guess, but you kind of like between 17 and, and that, then that point, you kind of like, uh, I guess forget about it maybe a little yeah. bit, right? You're like, oh, I'm good. I, you know, I'm new. You go back into like the, yeah. you know, I'm an athlete. I can do this. I can do, you know, I, I'm like, I'm a stud. I can do whatever yeah. I want. Live a whole crazy lifestyle, and then you get to that point, and you're kind of reminded. Yeah. Hang on a second. I've been given a new lease on life, but I've Boom. kind of like ruined it or kind of taken it for granted. Boom. Right. That's exactly right. And then you get you're like, I'm not ready to meet my maker because. Like he's going to tear me a new one. Yeah, (laughs) basically. Yeah. 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 And that's why I'm thankful for brokenness. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he breaks us to save us. Yeah. And that's all throughout the scripture. It's all throughout the Bible. And one of my favorite things is about it is that brokenness is the place, you know, when we're at that low, Mm -hmm. dark pit, it's that place where he stops us. He halts us. He Mm -hmm. kills our progress so that we realize in and of ourselves with all that we have, all that we are, that we're utterly insufficient without him. Yeah. And that's when it came to realization that like, wow, I need you. Like, I need you for real this time. And then from there, he like answered my prayer through a cool way, which is I I love what you do, brother. Like and how you invest so much time in social media, Mm -hmm. podcasts across the board, giving people hope, Mm -hmm. inspiration is because, you know, he used a young lady in the brink of that moment, after yeah. these thoughts, I'm running through all this stuff. He used a young lady to write me a message in that in that moment uh, on my phone. My phone lit up like a Christmas tree. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It was so dark in that room, but I pick it up and I, you know, I couldn't swipe right. I think it was a sidekick back then, yeah, or yeah. whatever, or whatever, a razor. But I, I hit it, the button, and then it had this amazing, you know, encouragement from her in the yeah. time I needed it most. Yeah. It was wild. And, 
Yeah. So, so that time you think I need to get out of Hollywood. I need to go back to Oklahoma or like what you need to get away from this crazy lifestyle, yeah. and the brand deals and, and the vine stuff. And what, I guess you, you, were you kind of growing? Obviously it wasn't just vine. It was every other platform. I assume that you were on as well. Right. Yeah. Kind of just crossing everything and so kind of good. grow it all. That's so true. Yeah, so it was mainly all the platforms that I was on. Yeah. But you know what was wild? Like, here's what basically told me I need to get up and go. And I really left the next day. Mm -hmm. But as I'm in this house and I came across that message and uh, it said, oh, how wide, how deep, how vast the love of God is and nothing in all creation. Oh, Mm -hmm. and nothing in all creation can separate us from this love that's found in Christ Jesus. And I was like, oh. I need to figure out what this love is. And yeah. I just started talking to him the best I knew how praying. But this is what was cool about that. As I fell asleep, drifted off to sleep that night, uh, four in the morning, I had woke up. I mean, I just, you know, was woke up, woken up. Mm-hmm. I don't know. And yeah. I was thinking like all that happened yesterday. I run over. I turn on the lights. This girl, man, I run back over, put the covers over my head. And I'm thinking like, um, like just what's next, you know, questioning that. Yeah. But out of nowhere, I have this utterance, this sort of pull to look underneath my bed. And this is what takes it to a whole nother level, bro. And I'm like, that's so weird. Why am I yeah. wanting to look underneath my bed? So I look underneath the bed. There was a suitcase I had never seen before. Yeah. In this home was um, it consisted of a lot of different people who would be in and out talents age you know yeah. actresses um, musicians would come in and out because our agency owned the home sure so as i pull it out i'm guessing it was someone's suitcase from a long time ago i crack it open there's some dirty stinky clothes in there <laughs> but on the top was gold it was the best treasure i ever it was even better than gold sweeter than honeycomb yeah. you know what i'm saying but i open up this book it was the Bible. Yeah. And as I crack it open, I go to these red letters, bro. It was the only ones that stuck out. Right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know at that time, but these were the words of Jesus. And they hit me head on like a semi truck. But it said this. It said, he that wants to keep his life must lose it. Mm. But he that loses his life for my name's sake shall gain it. And then this is what hooked me. It said, oh, what is it profit a man to gain the whole world, but yet lose his soul? And at that moment, I was like, I'm done. I'm done. So I grabbed that book. I left everything. I just grabbed my book back. And matter of fact, the Bible is the number one stolen book in the world. I stole that book (laughs) that day. Right? So I grabbed that book and I leave the car. I leave everything. The the, the G-Wagon. I jump over on the city bus and I just literally I'm reading the word of God. I'm reading the Bible and I'm riding this city bus all over the city, all the way until it ends up getting me downtown towards the Greyhound station. Uh I get downtown at the Greyhound station. I grab a ticket to Oklahoma and I jumped on the bus to Oklahoma that they took me 25 hours. I didn't sleep, eat or anything, but I ate of the word of God. I began to sing praises and songs to him and I'd never look back. And I came back here and I slept on my brother's floor right at UCL dorm. One of the camp or the apartments out there and slept on his floor until I figured out what was next in my life with God. Yeah. And that's what happened, man. He met me where I was. That's why I wrote the book, start where you are. Wow. That's that's a mad (laughs) story. Right. (laughs) That's That's insane. But by the grace of God. Yeah. Yeah. So then you like, you're like, right, I'm going to write a book about all my experiences. I so that's to. what we have behind us is yeah. start where you are start where you are yeah uh, this, uh, during this time as well like do you have like your Instagram at the time like you're like it's Jesus feed right yeah Jesus feed yeah do you have that oh no like how do you get is there a story of how you get that too yeah okay so I end up um, you know what all my social media platforms were used for my personal game before I came to Christ. And yeah. it was all, and I was really good at it, you know? Yeah. But when I came to Christ, I shut off all my stuff for a little bit. And I began to ask, you know, the Lord, what do you want me to do with it? And he ends up, you know, basically just telling me to keep my past on there because yeah. it would help people in their journey. Yeah, the so transformation. People, yeah, yeah, exactly. To be able to see it and feel it and yeah. savor it. Um, 
Uh, but what was cool is later I was like, I'm going to dedicate my life to social ministry. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because the young girl inspired me at my darkest moment yeah. through a social media post that, you know, I have a God who loves sure. me. This love is found in Christ and I need to share it with the world. So I began to do everything I could, yeah. you know, whatever I could to share this hope that I found and uh, it just yeah. took off and these platforms began to essentially grow like our I'm so blessed daily page grew to zero to five million. And then we have uh, Jesus feed that was, you know, zero to about one hundred seventy four thousand. Yeah. Then I have my personal and things like that. But whatever we can do to extend that hope and joy in life yeah. is found in Christ. We want to do it. That's so good. Yeah. It? So, yeah. So tell me tell me about the book. You, you know, you, you this whole story you go through and then you're like, right this is what leads to you writing the book yeah start where you are uh which is out now right obviously yeah. it's behind us and we have you can buy it on amazon and everywhere else definitely uh which we'll put the links to that down below if everyone wants to go buy it it'll be in the description um but yeah tell me about the book and the process of writing it and have okay. you, have you, you'd written books before yeah uh, so you kind of had an idea of how to write a book but like you said earlier, this one was like awesome. The one you really, you know, really Definitely. mean. I'll share a little bit how, you know, what inspired the book. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go into the, like some of the writing process. Yeah, but yeah. what was great, bro, is a little bit after I had came here, uh, writing wasn't on my mind or anything. But as I got in the county jail, mm -hmm. I started working because I had a criminal justice degree leaving the UCL. Started working in the county jail. And what I would do, which I felt like it was more of a calling for me rather than a career or a job, because it was something I was made to do, not just something I was paid to do. And I would go in there. I would meet people mm -hmm. from all walks of life. Oh. I would meet people from all walks of life and everything from the ch Thunder cheerleader who mm -hmm. just got the DUI to a guy that's upstairs in det detention, you know, dis disciplinary segregation for murder or whatever yeah. heinous crime. And when I would go to them and just speak and conversate and share their story, hear my story, just have a, a time where we get to get a heart to heart and we will finally get to this place where I began to share my faith. And when mm -hmm. I began to talk to them about it, they would all have the same answers. Like, like, um, do you realize where I am? You're asking me if I want God or if he wants me or if I'm love. Yeah. I, like I'm dirty. I like I've made a mistake. Like my life isn't good yeah. at all. Like, let me get my life together. And I, my prayer, my hope was that they'll understand that God, he runs to those who are far off and uh -huh. broken and that are sick. Jesus said, I came for those who are sick and, you know, the ones that need a doctor, you yeah. know, that need a savior. And my hope would start where you are was that it will sort of have this theme that sings that you are not too broken to be fixed. You're not too dirty to be cleansed. You're not too unworthy to be loved you're not too far to be reached yeah. like Jesus meets us right where we are to take us where we need to be and that's my hope that they would understand that all throughout scripture Jesus would meet people right where they were not where they wish they were or where they pretend to be yeah. right where they were in their brokenness and sinfulness and man I just pray that yeah someone would yeah. hear that and it would resound in their soul you yeah, know, the love of God. So the book then is just like the story of like getting to like your whole journey of studying yeah. and then getting to this point. True. Yeah. So a lot of it's my story, but I believe yeah. more importantly, it's the story of everyone that's going to pick up this book. It's the story of everyone who's in the Bible mm -hmm. and it's the story, uh, his story. Because it's Christ's story threaded through it all, redeeming our stories mm -hmm. to make it a greater story, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I just think, um, yeah, that was my heart behind just getting that book out there. Your dirt isn't too dirty for God. And I hope it helps someone out there, encourages yeah. them, you know, to run to the Savior. Yeah, I'm sure. So... You, you like the books you know you start writing and then working with ministry and you don't you leave the job at the mm. you leave that job that you're at yeah the, the county yeah the county yeah eventually i yeah. left it um i had an opportunity well you know a friend was working at the hospital 
you know, in the scripture, it highlights several people that, you know, God loves when we take care of them. One, it's the orphan and the widow. It's the fatherless. And that's where, you know, I would later get into a little bit more as far as being a missionary in the sure. Philippines with Manny Pacquiao, which is amazing. But I really, you know, felt called to the prisoners, those who are forgotten, yeah. you know, in a way. Okay. And and that's where I started. But the second place God took me was whenever I went to the hospital, Mercy Hospital here yeah. in Oklahoma City. What? Yeah. Where my all my boys have been born that in that hospital, which is amazing. But he took me to the hospital to learn how to care for those who are sick and those who are suffering. Mm-hmm. You know, um, that was the next place he took me uh, to learn from them and to care for them and serve them. And then after that, like the homeless uh, was more of my ministry. Yeah. And then I had got an offer to be an online pastor in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So I left for like a year and then I came back and now I'm devoting myself to me and my wife are going out missionaries yeah. in the Philippines. So it's just been a long deal of where yeah. we're trying to be intentional about ministering to everyone that God has a heart for, which is all sure. of us, but like specifically in those areas of like people being forgotten, yeah, yeah. those who are sick and things like that. Yeah. So why Philippines? Philippines, really good question. Like there was just burden for uh, the Philippines when I came across one, a documentary, mm-hmm. uh, but number two, of course, Manny Pacquiao, his story has always just amazed me. And uh, I had a good friend, uh, which is still my best friend, one of my mm-hmm. best friends, Cliff, that I started doing. He has a very similar story to me, uh, but in a different yeah. context, of course, he's in a third world country, but where God met him on online through social media, yeah. through someone and using it. And we both came together and started this online outreach ministry called I'm So Blessed Daily, which now has grown over, well, it's about 6.5 million people on there wow. now on Facebook, yeah. which I'm excited to stream this That's show together crazy. on there. What? Yeah, yeah. But what was amazing is he's from Philippines and he was that brother that really shared with me a deeper part sure. of God's heart for them and I went and experienced it been over there about four or five times yeah I've been working with Manny Pacquiao Foundation for the last year how is that and meeting it's been meeting incredible someone like that I mean he's He's, he's a legend. phenomenal, right? right? Yeah, I love Manny. Uh, but he's just a man who loves God and loves people. He loves yeah. his people, specifically in the Philippines. Yeah. And he's a senator currently, future, potentially, Lord willing, the president of the yeah. F- Philippines. We're all hoping for that. That's the direction oh, yeah. he's going. But yeah, he's a phenomenal guy, stand-up guy. He's not like, uh, what's his name, Floyd Mayweather, <laughs> cocky and, you know, yeah. <laughs> brash. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so that kind of now has been obviously. I mean, twenty twenty, you haven't been able to travel that much, but yeah. that's kind of where the plans of the future just still work. For, you know, still working for foundation and and travel yeah. back and help out as much as possible with your knowledge in social media. Definitely, I'm sure that's that's. I mean, that's all we have right at the moment. You can't travel, right? But you exactly. can post things, and people around the world can see these things. Boom. So, that's which is it. that's the way to help you spread you know the word and, and your yeah. thoughts and the, yeah. your insights and feelings and everything else so, amen yeah totally that's totally yeah that's that's really cool yeah like you know you see especially in this world right you know with this with the ability and the things that you've learned to grow social media and do social media things yeah. there's a lot of money in social media yeah and that, you know you could have gone down that route well you did but you could still be in that route still you know? yeah you exactly. could because that's where i mean there's social media people and social media famous is all is more famous than movie famous oh, now. Oh man, you know? isn't that wild? Right? You have social media people now in movies rather yes. than the other way around. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So, like, and it's some people listening to this might be a little older and they may not believe me, but believe me. Like it's yeah. <laughs> you know, like you've got kids on YouTube or kids on Facebook or whatever it is that are making bank, bank. you know, big time, like even crazy kids. money, yeah. like ridiculous money, like more money than you could ever dream of money. Right. Yeah. Like it's nuts. Yeah. Um, wow. you know, it's, it, it's, it, it's just, it's become its own thing and it, people have taken full advantage of it. But yeah. the thing for you is you could have gone and continued to be in that lifestyle, but you're not, you're putting your, uh, skills to yes. the word and spreading your experiences. Yes, yeah. Right? Devote my life uh, to basically 
please him and mm-hmm. like through what he's shown in his word like what is important it really yeah. changed the lens and the trajectory of my life yeah yeah which has been phenomenal and fulfilling man it's just been a great joy to not yeah. have it be about me anymore you know but yeah. about the person across from me wherever i am and the children i'm raising and my wife and the neighbor and then the nations you know mm. yeah yeah just a camera so you need a phone right yeah You're that's it go. bro yeah. <laughs> in a in a blink of an eye yeah. right, right there in front of people that's it's beautiful amazing. uh so where where can everyone kind of follow you on instagram and follow the pages and, and buy the book and stuff like that awesome bro so yeah anywhere Rashawn copeland would be awesome um we do have a uh, scriptures and stories podcast which i need to get you on mm-hmm. sometime dude yeah, to get it. your story and um and then any you can buy the book anywhere books are so barnes and noble here locally if you want to go get a signed copy mm-hmm. is available now uh, at all barnes and nobles locally i think even norman and then uh yeah um, um, Amazon is one yeah. of the key places people tend to go. So awesome. Awesome. Great. Well, Thank yeah. you, bro. Man, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me at the house. And, and for everyone listening, I'll post, as always, the links down below. You can go click on and follow Sean by the book that uh, you're definitely worth it because. I'm sure there's a lot more to the story and I'm sure we'll, we'll get to it again on another, we'll definitely do another podcast. I'm sure. Uh, I love your awesome. show too, uh, bro. So I commend yeah. you and all you're doing, man. It's incredible. Thanks, man. I appreciate your time. Uh, for everyone listening, we will catch you next episode. Cheers. This podcast was presented by the Oklahoma hall of fame. Who've been telling Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. Follow them online at Oklahoma HOF.com and definitely on Instagram at Oklahoma HOF. Catch you next episode. Cheers. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.